Well, joining us today is a noted educator in that, that arena. He is a, a physician, uh, a, uh, an expert in the field of clinical nutrition, as well as a professor of gastroenterology. Dr. Goldberg, hello and welcome. Good morning, Deborah. Pleasure to be back. Oh, this is, this is a great topic because there are all too few gastroenterologists out there who get it, Dr. Goldberg. It's a very, very large topic, and Deborah, this really blends right in with our topic of the past couple of weeks talking about rheumatoid diseases, because here we are, back again, talking about inf- inflammation. And that's such a key point, Dr. Goldberg, because I may, you know, we may have some listeners say, oh, you know, I don't have digestive problems. You know, I'm worried about psoriasis. I'm worried about rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> I'm worried about lupus. It's connected, isn't it? It's all very connected, and it's, it's really more valuable sometimes to look and see what do all these conditions have in common rather than to look at what do they have that are, are different from each other. Different doctors are, treat uh, dermatologists, treat inflammation of the skin. Gastroenterologists treat inflammation of the colon. Rheumatologists treat inflammation of the joints. But, you know, if you look at what they're actually doing, the actual practice of medicine in all those different areas is virtually identical. Anti-inflammatory drugs, steroids, immune suppressants. So there is a link that goes through all of these things. And it's very common in my practice when somebody comes in and they have arthritis, of systemic arthritis of some type, they also have inflammatory bowel. If they have inflammatory bowel, they oftentimes have a skin problem. And the list goes on and on. So there is a close connection between all these different inflammatory conditions. And many of us were on all the medications and then some, you know, the steroids, the, uh, the uh, uh, anti-inflammatories because we were having a joint pain, the antispasmodic uh, medications, the antibiotics, and only told, eat what you can tolerate, you worry too much, here, take these pills. <laughs> yeah, and it's a shame because there are so many people that are affected with these inflammatory bowel conditions. Uh, these include both ulcerative colitis, and also Crohn's disease. And uh, then we have a related category called uh, where we have irritable bowel syndrome. And in those cases, uh, the patient has gone into a doctor and they complain that they're having alternating constipation and, and diarrhea, and the bowel is irritable, and the doctor takes a look at it and does some tests and comes back and says, I've got your diagnosis, you have irritable bowel syndrome. So actually the patient hasn't been told anything that they didn't already know. And then we have another category where we call inflammatory bowel diseases, where the symptoms uh, are, again, uh, oftentimes constipation, a lot of diarrhea, a lot of inflammation, pain, uh, uh, nausea, fever. But in these cases, the bowel lining can actually be found to be not only irritated, but inflamed and bleeding. And these patients have a much more serious time of, of trying to recover, and it's very difficult under standard medical care. Now, contrast for us, if you would, uh, please, Dr. Goldberg, because I went through all those tests and then some. And, of course, uh, most people listening to us who have uh, uh, these diagnoses who, who are, have had them have been through all these diagnostic tests. And the difference between identifying this pathology and actually identifying and discussing with the patient the function of their digestive tract. The characterization has been that there's a lot of difference between so-called irritable bowel uh, syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease. And if you look at a lot of the older medical textbooks, they say it's important to differentiate the two and that they're really fairly distinct and that there wasn't much connection between them. That line is now getting a little bit fuzzy. And I certainly have found in in my practice uh, in Atlanta that a lot of people who have irritable bowel syndrome will come in to see me, and they've already evolved into inflammatory bowel disease. Then when people have the inflammatory bowel disease, there's another uh, differentiation that's made medically between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And the typical gastroenterologist, the typical medical internist, will make uh, fairly extensive efforts to try to differentiate between the two. And let me just tell your listeners just a little bit about the differences between them. In, in Crohn's disease, it normally affects the terminal portion of the ileum. And in ulcerative colitis, it, as the name implies, it's a colitis, an inflammation of the colon. So the uh, gastroenterologist will typically do um, a colonoscopy, which is a procedure where they go up through the rectum with a uh, flexible uh, scope, 
and they look at the lining of the bowel to determine how much inflammation, if there's pathology there, and how far that inflammation goes. Uh, barium uh, x-rays may also be taken, and sometimes endoscopy is also done coming from the, the mouth on, going on down as well. Despite all of the, the uh, efforts that are made to differentiate the difference between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, the treatment nonetheless is virtually identical except for one thing. That's so and frustrating, this is kind Dr. of an interesting thing, Deborah, in, in that they will talk about ulcerative colitis being curable. And that's a very interesting thing to the patient whose eyes are going to light up when they're told there's a possible cure until they're informed what that cure is. And the cure for ulcerative colitis is to remove the entire colon. Well, to me, that's like saying the cure for a headache is to remove your head. So there are some problems there. But the, the, the actual treatment of these medically is virtually the same in terms of the types of drugs that are used, and the symptoms are somewhat similar, similar also. And my premise is, Dr. Goldberg, and you can tell me if your patients concur, uniformly frustrating. <laughs> to, well, very to the frustrating. Patient. Yes. You know, uh, as uh, one of my professors used to say to me, a good set of bowels is more important than a good set of brains. And when, you're, when your bowels are not working well, when your dige- digestion is not working well, it affects people in all types of ways. First of all, it oftentimes leads to depression, frustration, and uh, you, can, you can say, well, try to be optimistic, try to see the bright side of things. But when you're feeling that bad, it affects your chemistry. It affects the way you act. It affects the way you feel. And it's pretty hard to get around that. So uh, it's, it, we have to see there's a link between what goes on in the gut and what goes on in the brain. Now, in the old days, and that wasn't the old days are not that long ago, people used to talk about ulcerative colitis as being emotionally induced. Well, sure. well you worry I, I'm not saying much. that would never happen, but the evidence is really very, very weak on that. More likely, when you see patients who have ulcerative colitis, and these, again, are people who may be running to the bathroom 20 and 30 times a day to cramp and have pain and bleeding, losing weight, having other uh, uh, extra intestinal symptoms as well, that kind of a problem, that kind of weakness, that kind of stress can make people feel depressed. It can make them feel stressed. So we maybe look, have looked at putting the cart before the horse in the past, not so much that being depressed causes colitis, but that colitis can cause depression and anxiety. Although, don't you think there, there is a mind-body connection that we do tend to store those emotions and those neurotransmitters, uh, just like the ones in our brain and our spinal uh, cord can also affect other organs, Dr. Goldberg? Absolutely. And, you know, we, we, we talked about uh, uh, neur- psychoneurogastroenterology is kind of a new term that we're throwing around now, where the effect of the mind on the GI tract. So, it, and, and it is very clear for people that are in practice, doctors in practice have seen this, that when people have the condition, that when they get under stress, the condition gets worse. So one of the things that needs to be done is to try to lift the person's spirits and to look for areas of stress in the life and trying to relieve them. The amount of nervous tissue or nerve cells in the GI tract is enormous. In fact, there are as many neurons in the GI tract as there are in the entire spinal cord. So as part of a recovery, uh, working to help the person to relieve stress, to quiet their mind, using various types of uh, biofeedback can be very, very helpful. In some cases, essential. But almost in all cases, it can be helpful. And when we return, I want to uh, uh, ask you to educate us about one of the prime areas that I found both uh, frustrating and just, just maddening. And that was eat what you can tolerate because it all made me sick. <laughs> the fact right. that the gastroenterologist yeah. couldn't help me pinpoint that. And, you know, everything that I tried just continued to make it worse. We want to go back to uh, to basics and talk about identifying food because many of us think in terms of good foods and bad foods when even some of the good foods can be bad for us. Dr. Paul Goldberg joining us today. We're talking about ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. You're invited to join us. Any of your questions at 800-307-3002 right here in the Deborah Ray Show. We're going to talk about that basic frustrating approach. Eat what you can tolerate when it all <laughs> makes you very sick, Dr. Goldberg. Quite commonly, Deborah, when a person comes in with these problems, the physician will tell them basically to eat what they can tolerate. Uh, well, that's basically what the patient's been doing when they come in there in the first place. Uh, and patients look for uh, diets that they can follow to relieve them. 
And that oftentimes goes into a very frustrating and endless search simply because the machine that converts food into flesh, that being their GI tract, is not working well. So when you have patients who put something in their mouth that's passing out through their rectum, you know, three or four hours later, sometimes even less, that's not a bowel that can necessarily handle almost anything at that time. Uh, this is why in some cases, uh, certainly at, at the Goldberg Clinic where, where I practice in Atlanta, that we first put the patient on a very limited dietary, uh, occasionally a total fast just on water for a few days, uh, oftentimes a liquid diet, and that's simply to give the bowel, the GI tract, a rest. Now, this is not a cure, but this is a preliminary step. Deborah, when somebody has a broken leg, we don't run on it. Uh, when somebody has a sprained ankle, we don't want them to go on a hike. But, but, but highlight token, that, yeah, but highlight that because when I had the ruptured diverticuli and was hospitaled, you know, for uh, for ten days in ICU on antibiotics, when they started, you know, to to feed me, you know, that the bland hospital diet was something you know, that I don't equate with being healthy and nutritionist, and I think you mean something completely different, Dr. Goldberg. Well, initially to put somebody on a, on a, on a limited dietary is simply to allow that bowel arrest. And then after that, we want to incorporate the correct foods, foods that will build health. Our idea is not to soothe the colon. Our idea is to help it to heal. Okay. So once the body has the ability to absorb, to digest food and absorb food, then we start giving the person a nourishing diet. That diet, however, really needs to be individualized for that person. Uh, one of the things that should be looked at is how much they're eating. A lot of people create bowel problems simply because they have overeaten for years. They've simply overextended the capacity of their gut to, to digest and absorb food. Another thing that needs to be checked out is to see if the person has food allergies. Uh, I, I disagree with the idea that food allergies are the causes of all these problems, but they certainly play an important contributing role in many of them. So doing proper blood tests to see what kind of allergies the, the, the person has uh, is oftentimes a, a very good idea to rule that uh, in or to rule that out. Are these primarily immediate reactions or delayed or a combination of both? Well, they can be a combination of both, but by far the most common types of reactions you'll see in chronic conditions like this, Deborah, are going to be the uh, IgG-mediated uh, allergies, which are the delayed type. These are the type of allergies that give their symptoms to the person sometime between 4 hours and 72 hours after they've actually ingested the food. Those are the more, more commonly ones that you'll find. Because the thing uh, that was I I'm sorry, go ahead. The thing that was eye-opening to me, Dr. Goldberg, is I equated it with, you know, did I eat healthy or not, and didn't get it that I could be sensitive to things that I thought were healthy, because I thought in terms of good foods and bad foods. Right, and this brings up the whole idea again of uh, what Roger, Dr. Roger Williams talked about, of biochemical individuality. Uh, number one, the very best of foods is no better than the very worst of foods if we can't tolerate them. So... Uh, the person needs to be looked at carefully to see what kind of uh, foods are correct uh, for them. Now, there certainly are some general rules for everybody. We do know that inflammatory bowel diseases, the ulcerative colitis and the Crohn's disease, are much more common in industrialized, westernized nations, such as the United States, France, Germany, England, Israel, countries that have lifestyles that are similar to ours here in the United States. And in the so-called uh, more primitive areas, uh, I, although that may not be the best use of words, in the, non -co in the non commercialized areas and non-industrialized areas, uh, these diseases are not totally absent, but they are seen in a, to a far lesser degree. One of the things that has been observed is that in those areas where there's a lot of use of uh, large amounts of refined carbohydrates, and, and Deborah, I know that repeatedly you've talked about this on your program, uh, this does increase the incidence of these inflammatory bowel diseases in the population. And there may be a number of reasons for that. First of all, refined carbohydrates, the soda pop and the sugars and the white flour products, change the uh, insulin levels and the levels of insulin resistance in the body. And secondly, it also causes alterations in the normal gut flora, the bacteria in the GI tract. So these are studies that have been done in, in very reputable journals, such as the Journal of Gastroenterology, where they've taken patients, they've put them on diets that are devoid of refined carbohydrates, and in some patients they have seen significant improvement 
uh, by doing that. And you were talking about in the hospitals, it's, it's notable in the hospitals when they have patients with these problems, they're doing just the opposite. They're feeding them uh, diets that are, are uh, full of refined carbohydrates and things that might actually aggravate the condition. Yeah, it just it just it just blows your mind because uh, you know after uh, I got off the you know the the IVs for ten, for ten days it was like I'm not going to eat that food. <laughs> Please, right. you know, somebody bring me something real and healthy to eat. <laughs> well, you had to go home for that. We yeah, absolutely. Well, we do have uh, lots of people want to talk with you, Dr. Paul Goldberg. Joining us today, we're talking about inflammatory irritable bowel syndrome, colitis, Crohn's disease. You're invited to join us. It's toll free one eight hundred three zero seven three zero zero right here in the Deborah Ray Show. He's Dr. Paul Goldberg joining us today. He is an expert in the field of clinical nutrition, a clinical epidemiologist. He's a noted uh, professor of gastroenterology, and we're talking about inflammatory bowel disease, colitis, Crohn's disease. And while Richard wasn't able to uh, to stay with us, Dr. Goldberg, an ideal opportunity, if I can just push a little, just because, you know, I, I was there, and all those tests, you know, why they certainly do have their place, doesn't tell me anything about the function, you know, why Richard was having those symptoms, and there was absolutely no advice about the, the healing process, the lifestyle factors that ultimately, uh, you know, involved my recovery from this condition. Right, Deborah. And so we're looking at the difference between looking for organic pathology, looking for changes in the tissue, which are the end process of a disease, and that's what a gastroenterologist will typically look for in these problems looking uh, through endos- endoscopy for actual changes in the tissue membranes versus doing a functional analysis on the person to seeing what is wrong with the way the body is functioning and why is that occurring. And in our clinic, we refer to that as clinical epidemiology. Uh, different types of tests, too. Are it a test, again, to look just for it to identify the diseased tissue, or are they tests to look for why that tissue may be becoming diseased? So functional analysis versus uh, pathological or organic analysis, uh, quite a bit different. One of the things that the listener should look for when they choose a a doctor, they choose a physician, is somebody that's going to spend some time with them, not just a a cursory exam and uh, a lot of uh, tests, but is actually going to sit down with them, talk with them in at length, explore their lifestyle with them, and a good uh, first I'm with a doctor. A good case study, a good case history, and a physical exam should really take a minimum of about an hour. We schedule all of our patients at the first visit for an hour and a half, a full hour and a half. And that's not a lot of time to really get to know somebody and learn about their habits and see what kind of a uh, plan needs to be put together for them. 